All righty. We are done. How did you like it? I like it. I hope you did too. I know you did because you're smart like me. Um, we are going to read the epilogue now. It is only three pages. Okay. It is uh, begins on page 170. You need the final sheet of questions. And we have four vocabularies. We have valor, cholera, buffalo soldier, and epitaph. I will use each one in a sentence and you try to figure out what the definition is. All right. Uh, valor. The soldier showed great valor by running across the enemy lines to save the wounded general. Valor. He showed great valor. What is that? That is B, bravery. You are correct. Number two, cholera. Um, the woman contracted cholera from drinking dirty water and it left her so dehydrated that she died. What is cholera? A, I hope you said A, it's a disease with severe diarrhea. Uh, three, a buffalo soldier. Um, Many of the freed slaves after the Civil War um, got jobs for the U.S. government serving as Buffalo Soldiers on the Western Frontier, meaning, remember where we saw how the map of the United States at that time had just giant wide open areas in the middle section that were called um, Oklahoma Territory or Indian Territory because they had not been turned into states yet. That's where the Buffalo Soldiers served. So they actually did a lot of fighting with the Native Americans that were being pushed out. Okay, so after my long-winded <laughs> explanation, you probably realize that three is D, African American soldiers who served on the Western frontier after the Civil War. Number four, epitaph. An epitaph then are the words that are written on a person's tombstone. The epitaph is not their name and the date of their birth and death. The epitaph is a little summary of that describes the character of the person. Okay, that's an epitaph. All right, here we go. Epilogue, page 170. During the summer of 1939, when Clody Henley was 92 years old, she was interviewed by Lucille Avery a student at Fisk University, which is in Nashville, Tennessee. Miss Avery, along with many other writers, had been hired by the government to visit aging slaves and record their stories. Clody's story first appeared in the Virginia Chronicle, summer 1940. Miss Avery visited Clody at her home in Hampton, Virginia, and for over two months, Clody shared her diaries, photos, and papers. From Miss Avery's research, we know that Clody served as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, helping over 150 slaves get to freedom, and as a spy for the Union Army from 1862 to 1865. Do you remember which side of the Civil War was it the Union? Were they the North or the South? They were the North. I knew you were smart. Uh, she was awarded a commendation by General Ulysses S. Grant for her valor. During the war, however, life at Belmont changed forever. Briley Waithe was at Fort Sumter with Edmund Ruffin Sr., who fired the first shot. That was the first battle of the Civil War. Mass Henley lost an arm at the Battle of Fredericksburg, and Ms. Lilly went mad when Yankees a.k.a. Northerners, Union soldiers, camped on Belmont grounds and turned the big house into a Union hospital. Aunt T used all her knowledge of roots and herbs to save the lives of soldiers, even when Army doctors snickered and called it voodoo. They stopped laughing when she saved more lives than they did. Sadly, Aunt T died of cholera on Christmas Day, 1864, months before the war ended. 
She was buried beside Uncle Heb in the plantation cemetery. When Missy's mama died, she ran off and later married a buffalo soldier out west. After the war, Mr. Harms arranged for Clody to travel up north, where she received a hero's welcome. After several business failures, failures, Mr. Harms moved to Scotland, where he dropped out of sight. Although Clody never met Sojourner Truth, she did meet Frederick Douglass, with whom she corresponded until his death in 1895. In 1875, Clody returned to Virginia, where she attended Virginia Colored Women's Institute, then dedicated her life to the education of former slaves, women's suffrage, that means women's ability to vote, equal rights, and justice for all people, regardless of race, creed, or nationality. Inside her diaries, Ms. Avery found two other interesting items that helped conclude Clody's story. One was a photo and packet of letters from Dr. William Monroe Henley, who had become a professor of philosophy at Oberlin College in Ohio. He had been disinherited by his father for taking a stand against prejudice. Through education, Mr. Harms did more to destroy slavery than all the laws on the books could legislate, he wrote to Clody in 1891. There was another photo of a handsome elderly couple surrounded by a large family. On the back was written, to our beloved sister friend Clody, from Hintz and Rose Henley and family, 50th wedding anniversary, Louisville, Kentucky, 1910. Spicy is holding a Bible in her hand and Hintz has a quilt folded over one knee. There's an old article from a Kentucky newspaper attached to the photo praising Hintz for being one of the finest horse trainers in the racing business. Clody never married or had children of her own, but when she died on May 6, 1941, hundreds of her former students attended the funeral. As a teacher, she had challenged them. As an activist, she had inspired them. As a friend, she had encouraged them. Clody Henley's legacy lives on in the epitaph engraved on her gravestone. Freedom is more than a word.